Could we really grow all of our food in cities? Now, in recent episodes, I know I've been talking a lot about urban agriculture, why it would be nice, why it would be healthy, why it would be culturally enriching, but I haven't really dropped the ecological hammer until now. Today, I'm going to go so far as to say we really kind of have to start growing most or even all of our food in cities, which raises fairly obvious questions such as, has this been done before? And what's the best way to make it happen? Not to worry, as a certified permaculture designer and former market gardener, I've got you covered. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. Now, just as a reminder, the purpose of Edenicity is to end the mass extinction through abundant urban design. We are kicking austerity to the curb and saying no to inconvenient truths and yes to design solutions that are so integrated and efficient that we can enjoy a higher quality of life while healing the world. Today I'll be referring to the Edenicity reference design, which you can download from the link in the description, and I'll be critiquing it a little bit as well. Why grow food in cities? Well, in a few short generations, we've managed to wipe out half the world's living biomass. According to this 2018 Global Biomass Inventory. Sorry to do this, but I was just editing this video and I realized that that last point really needs to be understood in its full context. The living biomass of the earth is mostly plants and plants provide all the energy that life uses to live and survive and recover from crisis. You can think of plants as the energy source for all of life. I've lived long enough that I've had people in my life go in for heart surgery and come out feeling much more energetic when the full function of their energy source was restored. I've also been crushed when a doctor told me that a close family member's cardiac function was at 50%. That's where we're at with all of life on Earth right now. In this episode, I'll be giving you some deep history about why the massive industrial model of agriculture is failing us and destroying the life on this planet. And what the alternative is, we occupy 50% of the land, and most of that, some 70% of that, is in monocrop agriculture, which, as I mentioned in the last episode, has severely damaged an enormous amount of soil. According to this paper, some 40% of agricultural land is severely degraded. And according to this book, which I mentioned last time, that's an area the size of China and India. Meanwhile, cities occupy 2% of the land, but they use it very inefficiently, as I will illustrate for you later in the program. What cities provide that vast tracts of agricultural land do not is an intensity of labor and attention that may be sufficient to tame this problem. It's a perfectly fair question to ask if it's such a great idea to pull the agriculture culture back into cities, why hasn't this happened before? Well, it kind of has. Ancient cities were compact trade centers ringed by farms, and the scale of the cities and the surrounding region was generally small enough that it was a fairly short walk into the city. In this book, David Montgomery provides a very detailed discussion of agricultural practices in ancient Rome shortly after it was founded. He writes, Early Roman farms were intensively worked operations where diversified fields were hoed and weeded manually and carefully manured. The earliest Roman farmers planted a multi-story canopy of olives, grapes, cereals, and fodder crops referred to as cultura promiscua. Interplanting of understory and overstory crops smothered weeds, saved labor, and prevented erosion by shielding the ground all year. Roots of each crop reached to different depths and did not compete with each other. Instead, the multi-crop system raised soil temperatures and extended the growing season. In the early Republic, a Roman family could feed itself, working the typical plot of land by hand. Family estates were half a hectare to one hectare, basically one to two acres. But 250 years later, when iron tools became common, people plowed their fields and took an axe to their forests, and things changed. These devices saved enormous amounts of labor, so it was much easier to work the land. But the land became a little less fertile, and the farmers needed to feed the oxen that pulled their plows, and the growing area for the cattle feed took a little extra space. Some 700 years after Rome was founded, Pliny the Elder, writing in the first century lamented how absentee landlords living in the cities had plantation overseers working what used to be their family estates. The overseers and the slaves had a huge incentive to maximize the returns from the cash crops that they were growing, and very little incentive to maintain the long-term soil fertility, and the absentee landowners were far less able to inspect the soil on the day-to-day -day basis that their ancestors were able to do. This worsened the soil loss 
and eventually it took 10 times as much land to produce the same amount of food. According to Montgomery, this was a major factor in both Rome's need to expand its empire and its eventual fall. Now, over the centuries and throughout the world, there are many examples of either urban agriculture or peri-urban agriculture. Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital that is now Mexico City, had what is argued by many permaculturists to be the world's most efficient form of agriculture, the chinampas, which were basically little garden islands in a network of canals. And as you can see on this map, they surrounded the island city. In recent centuries in Europe, as cities grew in the horse and buggy era, the abundance of horse manure within the city provided an ample source of compost for French intensive gardening within the city. The United States and many parts of Europe also maintained victory gardens within the city during World War II. And Russia, as well as the former Soviet states, have a long tradition of dachas, which are personal gardens just outside the city, which many people could access via public transit. Over the years, a number of different sources have reported that dachas have provided anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the food that people ate in the former Soviet Union. So urban agriculture Culture really does have a long global tradition, which came to a screeching halt with the advent of highways and sprawl, as well as really large-scale farming. Which raises the question, how should we go about urbanizing agriculture today? Well, in the Season 1 podcast of Edenicity, I was thinking in very utopian terms and pictured Edenicity as completely new cities that would be built as complete integrated systems, like open-air versions of Biosphere 2. That was the three-acre greenhouse that a group of eight people were sealed in for two years in the Arizona desert. Several of the bionauts, as they were called, have written books on the topic. I've really enjoyed this one. See the links in the description. It was a really elaborate terrarium that simulated all of the different biomes of the earth. Deserts, oceans, rainforests, savanna, pretty much everything was simulated in different components of Biosphere 2. The bionauts grew their own food and also took care of the place, and it proved to be really challenging because it turned out to be an El Nino year, which reduced the total amount of sunlight, and that combined with the shadow of all the greenhouse structures reduced the sunlight to the point where the total productivity was pretty low. In addition to that, the concrete had not fully cured, so it was pulling carbon dioxide from the air, which started to reduce the total amount of oxygen in the air due to the respiration cycle. They ended their mission significantly underweight due to partial starvation, and also pretty short on oxygen. For me, the lesson is all or nothing, do or die design may not be the best idea available, and one should look at other alternatives. Plus, of course, ecologically speaking, we shouldn't be building new cities. There's lots of cities. They're very inefficient in their use of space. So in season two, the theme became Edenizing existing cities, which raises the question, aren't cities already too crammed full of buildings and people and other infrastructure for there to be any room for farming? No, actually, one of the key concepts with Edenicity is to build car-free cities, which is a rapidly growing trend around the world today. In fact, just this morning, I saw this in my Twitter feed. A fellow YouTuber mapped the total surface of parking lots in Spokane, Washington, and it added up to a really large fraction of the total area in the image. I got to wondering about Columbus, where I live, and it turns out that parkingreform.org has made over 100 maps of the total area devoted to parking in different U.S. cities. The shocker is that parking alone takes up 25 to 50 percent of the area of many U.S. cities. When you add the road infrastructure and all of the architectural responses to cars, such as green strips between the sidewalk and the street, and setbacks between the street and people's houses, you come up with an enormous amount of area that could be much better used for other purposes, such as housing and agriculture. So what's the Edenicity plan? We need to plan top-down, as the better cities in the world are already planned today, and then, as we build, take careful measurements of what we're doing and make adjustments as we build out from small projects to larger projects. Let me review the reference design real quick. Edenicity uses the Constellation City concept, which is popular among cities such as Singapore, and is gaining traction in city plans all over the world. The idea is to subdivide a city into regions of one to two million people, then subdivide each of those regions into five to ten towns. The towns are pretty self-sufficient. You could meet most of your needs through a whole lifetime in a town and only leave your town on 
special occasions, to visit the regional centers or the city center. This is all pretty standard stuff, but it is at this scale and smaller that we start to see what Edenicity adds. The towns are separated by tree belts that are maintained as a timber reserve and to provide everyone in the city with easy access to green spaces. Even cities like Houston are getting on board with this with their Bayou Greenways initiative, which has put a green space within walking distance of most of the population within just the past decade. The towns, in turn, are divided into 20 to 30 villages, and the villages are separated by farm belts. Each of the villages, in turn, has 20 to 30 blocks. Each block has an orchard, and each or at least most of the buildings have rooftop gardens. The idea is to put the crops that need the most daily attention closest to where people live. And these will also be, in all likelihood, your highest yielding crops. In the case of the rooftop gardens, I was assuming some aquaponics, which has fish in the loop to fertilize the plants, and things like soldier fly compost to feed them. But the question arose, is there enough space? An alert viewer look at one crop, in this case wheat, and ask, is there enough room in all of those farm belts to grow enough wheat to feed the population? And his answer was basically no. It was too low by a factor of six, even assuming twice the standard agricultural yield. Now, I took a look at the wheat consumption and it turned out to be 100 kilograms per person per year, which is believable in some parts, and that's just wheat. You mentioned growing fruits and veggies in zones one and two, but I don't know if there will be enough to close the gap. Yeah, actually, when I ran the numbers, they were on the low end of the estimates that I had looked up, and it provided quite a bit more. But here's the thing we need to understand. Is there enough space? Not if we grow the wheat or corn like this. Instead, what I'm suggesting is that we grow it like this, like the ancient Romans did in a multi-story, multi-crop system, which is far more efficient than the monocrop system of modern mechanized agriculture. Remember, in the case of Rome, it was a tenfold decrease in productivity. And also recall from the prior episode, I'll put a link to it at the end of this episode, that we saw the same pattern throughout the world. In this amazing episode by Andrew Millison, we see how a food forest planted in Senegal was producing abundant year-round crops within two years of being planted. So it's just getting started, and the abundance that people were seeing was already remarkable. We also toured food forests in Vietnam and Austria, and it was the same story. Much higher yields, a much greater diversity of food, so we wouldn't be depending so much on any one grain for our calories. Soils and crops much more resistant to flood, fire, and drought. And according to David Montgomery from this book, actual surveys have reported yields anywhere from 10 to 100 times greater from intensive, multi-layered, small-scale farms. So yeah, I think we can do it. And even if we can't quite hit the numbers I'm talking about, well, we'll get to that in a moment. The plan for Edenicity would be to start at the block level, build an Edenicity block with those rooftop gardens and those orchards, and start measuring the actual yields. Step two, build a village with a farm belt. And since this is infill development in areas where road infrastructure and housing needs upgrades or replacement, obviously it won't have this perfectly squared off quality that you see here. I've drawn the farm belt in yellow as if it were a giant field of corn, but understand that this would be a mix tapestry of trees, ponds, pasture, and row crops. If those numbers work out, we build more villages and eventually a town center and surround the whole township with tree belts. Now, my skeptical viewer came back and said, I'd love to see that, and then suggested his own take, which was a city about 10 times bigger than Edenicity, but housing twice as many people. So basically five times bigger area per person. And here's how that would look. What he suggested was basically the exact same design as Edenicity. And yes, this is a design you see again throughout the world, as he mentioned. Basically, all you're doing is making the farm belts bigger. I got curious and ran in the numbers for something that wasn't quite five times bigger in area, but it was still substantially larger, and really dialed down my expectations to far below levels that have already been measured throughout the world. And it was still producing 165% of the food demand within the city. I got to wondering what this would do to transportation. I mean, if everything's farther apart, what would this do to transit times and transit fares? It was a significant effect, but the times and fares were still pretty reasonable. Now, within the Edenicity design, villages are linked by sheltered bike paths and tram lines, and the two take about the same amount of time, depending on your level of fitness. In the original design, a day pass on a tram might cost you something like $3, and a trip to the neighboring village would take less than three minutes. In the modified design with the larger farm belts, you're looking at a $5 day pass for the tram, and a little bit over four-minute ride to the next village. The town centers are linked by underground metros, and here, the annual fare went up from $164 per resident per year to $258 per resident per year. I didn't want to let that go without mentioning that a couple hundred dollars a year is minuscule compared to 
what most people pay for automotive transportation. It's a full order of magnitude less than most of us pay. And drip times went from just under four minutes to almost six minutes, which is a pretty substantial increase. So there is a pretty strong incentive, both cost-wise and in terms of just convenience, to really take care of those farm belts so their fertility increases rather than decreases every year. I guess if this story has any big takeaway, it's that if we step back just a little bit from the need to design everything all at once, but still keep our eyes on the prize, we can and should grow all our food within cities. Okay, here are those links I promised earlier to those other urban agriculture episodes. And here's the video version of the Edenicity reference design. Take care, stay green, see you next time.